Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar CPD session on historic environment and development. My name is Opani. I work as a town planning consultant with LRM Planning, and I am the vice chair for the RTPI's Devon, Cornwall, and Somerset Young Planners. I'm joined today by my Young Planner Steering Group colleague, Faye, who works for Bailey Partnership. We are really looking forward to this webinar and we are pleased to have young planners joining us from all across the country, stretching from Plymouth to London and from Bristol all the way up to Scotland. We even have someone joining us all the way from Hong Kong. So welcome everyone. Before we get started, uh, just a few housekeeping matters. As delegates, you have all been muted. If you have a question for us, or the speakers, then please send your question via the question box in the GoToWebinar panel, which should be either on the right or top of your screen. If you have any technical questions pertaining to any issues with the webinar, you may also ask these here, and Charlotte, um, our organizer, will respond to you directly. We encourage you to ask questions using the questions feature throughout the presentation. There may be an opportunity between presentations for a question or two, but the majority of your questions will be posed on behalf of Faye at the end of the three presentations. And any questions not answered will be considered after the presentation, after the session, and answers will be emailed to all participants. If you personally lose connection to the session today, then please try rejoining using the link that was emailed to you from GoToWebinar. You may also want to ensure at this time that your Wi-Fi internet is at an optimum level by disconnecting from all other devices um, from the Wi-Fi. If the speakers lose connectivity tonight, then please wait in the webinar and keep an eye out on your emails in case we have to relaunch the session with a new link. Excellent. So to start the evening off, we're going to run a quick poll. And Charlotte's going to put that poll up on your screen. Um, okay, so without cheating, approximately how many listed buildings are there in England? And if you can select one of the following, 10,000, 85,000, 400,000, or 1 million. You'll have about 15 seconds to answer this, and then the answer will be revealed later. Perfect. So we're going to um, go on to our pr first presentation. So our first presenter is a principal heritage consultant with Cotswold Archaeology. He has a vast experience in the field, including a number of years as an archaeological officer for local planning authorities in the south of England. Please welcome Mr. Duncan Coe. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you, Apani. And um... Welcome everyone. Um, I suppose the first thing I should say is um, uh, at the end of this session, uh, I don't think you'll have the answer um, to conserve or not to conserve. Um, I suspect that you'll be as in the dark on that question as you were at the start. Uh, but on that downbeat note, uh, let's get going. Um, as Apani said, uh, I'm a principal heritage consultant for Cotswold Archaeology. Cotswold Archaeology are a registered charity that specializes in archaeological and heritage work, uh, operating for a wide range of clients uh, and uh, especially involved in development sector. Um, so we have a lot of experience of uh, working with clients uh, to uh, resolve heritage matters uh, through the planning process. Um, my task for the first part of today is, is really just to run through some of the basics um, about what the historic environment is, what heritage assets are, um, uh, the, the kind of numbers and the background to the system that we use today um, when we're working through the planning system or through other regulatory regimes. Uh, my, um, Richard Morris will then take over to talk about um, statements of significance and some of the work that Historic England are doing. And then I'm gonna come back later on uh, to talk about some of the practical issues uh, that stem from uh, some of the provisions in the MPPF. 
So let me start by talking about the historic environment. Um, traditionally in this country, we used to separate um, archaeology and uh, the built environment. Um, we've really realized um, over a 20 year period or so that, um, that that's probably an artificial separation and that actually there's very little of Britain which is truly natural. Um, human beings uh, have been working in the landscape uh, since at least the end of the last ice age, uh, approximately 10,000 years ago, uh, and we have been responsible for huge changes in that landscape. Uh, and if I take a, a local example in the southwest, uh, Dartmoor, which is often cited by experts as being one of the last wildernesses, one of the last truly wild places in, in the country, is anything but a wild place. And the vast array of archaeological evidence on Dartmoor attests to the level of human activity that has taken place here. And here at Hound Tor, uh, high up on Dartmoor, is a medieval village that thrived in the 11th, 12th and early 13th centuries, uh, at a time when most of Dartmoor would have been a very um, clearly defined agricultural regime um, and not the so-called wilderness that it is today. Of course, what we see today is also a product of human interaction and human decision making. Turning to um, heritage assets, uh, heritage assets is a term which has uh, come to prominence uh, over the last 15 years or so um, as a way of kind of bringing together all the different disparate elements that make up the historic environment. Um, and the MPPF pro provided a definition which is you know, used in the planning system. And, and as it quite clearly says, these are uh, features which merit some degree of consideration in planning decisions because of their heritage interest. Um, moving on, um, sorry, I should have gone, try and go back if I can. Um, of course, heritage as individual heritage assets themselves um, hide uh, multiple layers of understanding and, and interest and aren't all what they appear to be on the surface. And here's the classic example, here's Stonehenge in all its pristine uh, uh, late Neolithic and early Bronze Age glory, um, one of the wonders of our natural, uh, of our historic environment. But of course, what we see today is anything but a product of ancient uh, activity. What we see today is very much the product of 20th century intervention uh, at a time when it was considered that it was appropriate to re-erect and rebuild uh, most of the stones to get them back to what was considered to be an original condition. Most of the large sarsens that you see today are actually bedded in concrete to prevent them from falling over. And it's just a small example, but a high profile example of that you can't always judge a book by its cover when you're looking at uh, heritage sites and, and heritage assets. I think um, we're going to have a look at the poll now, are we not, on the results of the question that we had? Excellent. Yes, we are. And the results are um, 400,000 uh, was 69% of um, our guests. So just uh, right on that. Fantastic. Well done. You, you know your stuff clearly, <laughs> which, is, which is great. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the individual designations um, as we go on through this next part of the presentation, but just briefly set out that uh, in England, there are approximately 400,000 list entries, which comprises us in the region of about 500,000 individual buildings. That's because some buildings um, are listed as groups, and so you get more than one building within the list entry. Uh, of those, uh, around 2.5% are grade one. That's the top of the um, uh, level of, of, of interest. Um, uh, grade two star, about 5.5%. Um, these days, we tend to group two star and ones together um, as being the kind of highest level of significance. So about 7% of the, um, seven to 8% of the um, total number. So as you can see, the vast majority of listed buildings are grade two um uh, and you know are still uh, of nationally Im important but um not at the same level of importance as grade one or two star um scheduled monuments there are approximately 20,000 scheduled monuments but similar to the buildings that encompasses um uh, a lot of those are multiple sites multiple entries uh, especially going back to dartmoor there are a number of landscapes on dartmoor that include um a number of individual monuments within a single scheduling. 
And then there are uh, around 1,600 uh, registered historic parks and gardens, and at the last count, 43 registered historic battlefields. And of course, just again to reiterate the point, these can uh, be a wide range of different types of asset from the prehistoric through to the modern. And uh, that's uh, Greenham Common, those of you who know it, in uh, West Berkshire, uh, built in the early 1980s uh, as a home to the American cruise missiles um, and is now protected as a scheduled monument. At the top of the tree, in terms of designations, I suppose, are World Heritage Sites. Um, within the UK, there are, uh, at the current time, 27 World Heritage Sites, um, a wide range of interests, the Stonehenge landscape, Canterbury Cathedral, whole of the city of Bath, etc. cetera. Um, those in the Southwest will know Cornwall and West Devon mining landscapes. Uh, the most recent entry is the Lake District, um, designated or inscribed um, uh, more for its uh, uh, cultural uh, associations than its, uh, strictly speaking, heritage uh, designations. Um, in the UK, inscription by UNESCO brings no additional uh, statutory controls, but um, World Heritage Sites are listed in the MPPF as being one of those um, uh, assets of the highest significance. And of course, most of these are landscapes. We're not talking about individual monuments here. We are talking about um, landscapes uh, within which you know, a number of individual assets may have been located or found. Um, the Ancient Monuments and Archeology Archaeological Areas Act of 1979 is the piece of legislation which um, covers uh, scheduling and archaeological monuments. Uh, as it says here, this has its roots back to the late 19th century uh, uh, and originally was largely used for um, uh, protecting prehistoric monuments, um, but now includes a wide range of monuments of different types and periods. Uh, scheduling is discretionary, that's important to understand. Um, there's no uh, statutory requirement on the part of the Secretary of State or Historic England um, to um, place a monument on the uh, schedule, even if it meets all the criteria set out. And the Act um, controls a, a range of works, uh, as it says there, including demolition, damaging, removing, repairing, tipping, etc. So this is quite a restrictive piece of legislation. Uh, and in order to get consent to do a defined work, um, you have to apply for consent from Historic England, who have delegated powers from the Secretary of State. And just to make the point that um, again, a you know, wide range of different types of monuments. So in the top right there, you've got Porchester Castle, a Roman uh, Saxon uh, shore fort, try saying that quickly, um, with a nice medieval Norman castle in the corner uh, on the shores of um, the Portsmouth. Um, and then just below it there, you've got one of the late uh, 19th century forts on the edge of Portsmouth, so same function, but um, 1,500 years difference in date, both protected by the same piece of legislation. Uh, listed buildings, um, these are covered by the Planning Listed Buildings and Conservation Areas Act 1990, um, but the first Listed Building Act was the Town and Country Planning Act of 1947, and that 1947 is, uh, date is quite important because it does have an impact on understanding um, of things like curtilage listing, et cetera, something we, we may come back to later. Uh, the listed buildings um, are not discretionary. Um, for listed buildings, if a building meets the criteria, then it should be on the list. Um, but uh, as you get more modern, so the level of discretion given becomes greater. So for 20th century buildings, it becomes uh, more a, a selection rather than um, just putting everything on that meets the criteria. Um, section 66 of the Act is the relevant section which um, gives uh, responsibility to local authorities and the Secretary of State to give special regard um, to the preservation of listed buildings and their setting when uh, making planning decisions. 
And again, just to illustrate the point, a wide range of different types and, and styles of buildings from everything from, you know, uh, Blenheim Palace here, a grade one listed building set within uh, a grade one registered park and garden, down to something slightly more esoteric. Um, and these are recently designated roadside um, structures, uh, again, selected um, from a, a survey undertaken by Historic England, uh, where a small selection of the best examples were chosen to go forward for listing. Um, Register of Parks and Gardens and, and the Register of Historic Battlefields. Um, Historic England or, or English Heritage or whatever the uh, name of it was in 1953, uh, um, these, the, this power to create a, uh, a register was granted in 1953, but very little was done about it until the 1980s. And it was really in the 1980s when efforts were made to create a register of uh, important historic parks and gardens and a separate register of historic battlefields. Uh, and again, these aren't covered by a separate, any separate um, consent regime, um, but uh, the entry onto those registers does have weight in the planning system and is covered by the MPPF requirements. And just as a nice local example, Stourhead in Wiltshire is fairly obvious. Uh, I think we know what we're looking at there. It's a, a wonderful example of a planned uh, and designed parkland. Of course, some of these features and uh, here we've got Lansdowne in Bath, a registered battlefield, is just an agricultural landscape that happens to have had um, an important battle fought on it and may contain archaeological evidence relating to that battle. Uh, but obviously to the uninitiated uh, from the outside, it pretty much looks like a standard agricultural landscape. And that's fairly typical of most uh, of our registered battlefields. Uh, conservation areas, uh, these are also uh, covered under the Planning Listed Building Conservation Areas Act 1990, which does give the power to local authorities, or it doesn't give them the power, it actually requires them to actually look at their areas and determine which parts um, should be designated as a conservation area as a result of their special architectural or historic interest. Um, the Act also gives uh, a duty to local authorities to formulate and publish uh, proposals for the preservation and enhancement uh, of those designated areas. These are normally called conservation area appraisals. And if I'm honest, um, some local authorities have a pretty patchy record on that particular legal duty. Um, and the Act um, basically gives uh, the local authorities uh, the requirement to give special regard to the protection of those areas uh, in any planning decisions. Um, the MPPF, oh, my apologies, gone click too soon. The MPPF does um, provide um, an interesting um, little um, phrase here, which says that you know not every part of a conservation area um, will be of the same level of significance. And I think that's been that was written partly because there was a concern that areas were being designated um, not necessarily because of the special architectural or historic interest, or for other reasons. And um, this was a concern at the time when the MPPF was published. Um, it has to be said that it is, um, it, with a local, for conservation area designation, local authorities are judge and jury. Um, there's very l few grounds for appeal or, um, or, or process for arguing against their designation once a local authority has decided to take it forward. And I just wanted to touch on non-designated territories assets. This was a concept introduced really by the MPPF. Um, and when the, this was introduced by the MPPF in 2012, for a long time, people just thought that it meant basically anything that um, a local authority or a local authority advisor deemed to be significant. Um, it's interesting that in July, last year, 2019, um, the government updated the planning practice guide to provide some clarification on this matter. And their clarification essentially says um, that um, you can only define something as a uh, non-designated heritage asset if it has been publicly published as such um, and that that publication of that local list or whatever it happens to be has been through a, a, an appropriate process and those decisions are based on a sound evidence base. Um, 
So um, there is now an open question as to what a non-non-designated heritage asset is. Um, and that's something which is still a bit of an open open question um, because of course the MPPF doesn't speak about those heritage assets that fall below the level of non-designated. Uh, I'm going to leave it there and um, I'll be coming back in a, a few minutes to uh, I say just pick up on a few issues that we come across. So thank you ever so much for the first part of your presentation Duncan and um, just before we go on to Richard would you be able to explain to us maybe, and we've got a question, what is a curtilage listing? Uh, curtilage listing, um, uh, Richard might be able to chip in here as well, I hope, but um, a curtilage listing is a very complex um, issue that um, the courts have um, fought over for years. But uh, effectively what it means is that if a, uh, a building has an associated um, structure uh, within its, um, uh, curtilage, which was present and in the same ownership at the time of listing or at the time of the 1947 Act, is also protected by the listed status. Um, there is a very good webinar that um, Historic England did uh, in June last year and is available on their website. I think it was 5th of June 2019 it was, it was first done, but it's still available. Uh, and uh, I understand that it's a, it's a very good um, way if you're interested, if you, if you want to go and have a look at that. Historic England also publish a very good little guidance note, which helps explain some of the concepts behind that. It, it's a complicated, it's a complicated subject. Look at uh, our um, Historic England Advice Note 10, Listed Buildings and Curtilage. Excellent. Thank you very much, um, Richard. Um, sorry, Duncan and Richard. We're now going to run our next poll just to get a, uh, an idea of and understand our audience. So Charlotte, if you can run it, that's great. So who here has written or read a heritage statement? Never, or you read one or two, you read several, but never written one, you've written some basic statements, or you write statements all the time. You have about 15 seconds to answer this question. Excellent. And well, it seems that um, many of you have at least read some. 55% um, of you have, um, and 28% of you have written some basic statements. So that's uh, really good to hear. Uh, we have a very educated audience. So we're going to head off on to our next presentation. Um, Mr. Richard Morris, he's a senior reform and guidance advisor at Heritage, uh, sorry, Historic England. He prepared HEAN 12 the guidance note on statements of significance, and this afternoon he'll present to us on the topic of significance. Over to you, Richard. Uh, thank you, Apani. I'm just going to move the, on the little box. Um, oh, what's happening? You have disappeared, Richard. There you go. Uh, uh, right, sorry. Um, yes, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, quickly run through this thing. Uh, very quickly, uh, you've got a, uh, a quite the sorry. You will be getting the, uh, the 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 PowerPoint from this, which is quite a lengthy one. Uh, we we were before lockdown in the middle of running a series of training events in which I was talking for an hour. You're quite lucky not to um, if you did, it didn't attend them. You're quite lucky not to have, um, had to uh, listen to me for that long. Uh, it gives quite a lot of information, uh, which I won't, which I'll be running through really quickly, or possibly not even mentioning, uh, because I uh, don't have a great deal of time. But I thought it was quite useful for you to have it. Uh, it runs the the PowerPoint runs with the with the uh, with the advice note. The advice note, of course, is on our website, and if you just Google uh, Historic England statements for heritage significance, you could get go straight to it. Uh, just to work out how I how I move along. Um, this is the contents. Oh dear, what have I done? Uh, this is the contents of the Heen uh, of, of Heen Twelve. I won't be going through this now. 
uh, uh, just to let you know um, how it's set out, a bit of an introduction, some general advice, and then at the end, there's a bit of um, um, matter about the structure of statements of heritage significance, which I will mention uh, um, towards the end of this. Uh, we didn't for a long time actually produce any advice on statements of heritage significance, uh, but uh, a couple of bits of research which we did, uh, which you've got the, the links are there, uh, in the, the, in, they'll be on the PowerPoint. Uh, do go and have a look at those. They're quite interesting in terms of two different ways of cutting a slice through local authority planning decisions and planning applications. Isn't it wonderful that they're now um, all nearly all, all online, you can go away and have a look at this sort of stuff. What they showed was that the general standard of heritage statements in uh, heritage related applications uh, was really not particularly good and we needed to do something, we felt we needed to do something, to, a bit of advice about how to go about this. So hence we, we, we published the uh, advice note. Um, the two, the two bits of the two, these are the two probably the two most important slides here. Uh, the MPPF requirement being what it is. Um, just to say very quickly that paragraph 189 says that uh, local planning authorities should require an applicant in determining applications to describe the significance of any heritage assets affected, including any contribution to setting. The level of detail should be proportionate to the assets' importance no more than sufficient to understand the potential impact of the proposal on significance. As a minimum, the relevant historic environment record should have been consulted uh, and heritage assets used using appropriate expertise where necessary. Uh, and then it goes on to talk about um, the sites which have, um, 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 where there's the potential to include heritage assets with ar archeological interest, Local planning authorities should require developers to submit appropriate desk-based assessment or if necessary field evaluation. Um, I'll go on to that bit about archaeological interest in a bit. Uh, now that's what uh, that's one eight nine one ninety. Then says local planning authorities should identify and assess the particular significance of any heritage asset that may be affected by a proposal, including by development facing setting, taking account of available evidence and any necessary expertise. Uh, this should take, uh, they, they should take this into account when considering the impact of a proposal to avoid or minimize any conflict between the conservation of it and any aspects of the proposal. Um, before I go a, much further with that, I just wanted to, uh, to, to go on to something else, which, uh, oh, sorry, um, just about the significance of the PPG definitions. These are, these are um, um, Duncan mentioned significance and interest and so forth. Uh, the definition of heritage significance in, the her in heritage policy is given in the glossary of the PPG. It's often forgotten that some of the really crucial bits, of, uh, sorry, the, um, of the MPPF, some of the really crucial bits of how this how the MPPF works are actually in the glossary rather than being in the main text. Significance is the value of a heritage asset to this or future generations because of heritage interest. The interest may be archaeological, architectural, artistic or historic. That interestingly those definitions apart from archaeological was, wasn't in the MPPF in 2012 and uh, what wasn't put into the NPPF when it was redone last year, whenever it was, but uh, 2018. Um, it, however, did go into the P. They do are now in the PPG, and they uh, give up some some rather interesting background to the kinds of things that a statement of significance should actually be covering. Uh, just to run on from there. If this, um, in what we suggest in the in the advice is that it's useful to to uh, to use a staged approach in terms of decision making in applications affecting uh, heritage assets. The, the the reason, and this can be done by both the applicant and the decision maker. 
Therefore, if you're, you, 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 you're an applicant, you've got a proposal, you've drafted it, you've not completely worked out what all the, how all the work, moving parts work. But the, the really important thing is to start off, and this is where 189 comes in, understand the four materials history of the affected heritage assets and or the nature extent of archaeological deposits. And the second point from that is once you understand the history of something, once you understand um, uh, where its interest is, then you can work out what the significance is. Paranut 190 is understand the impact of the proposal on that significance. One of the slightly curious things about the, um, uh, about the NPPF uh, and uh, something which uh, we hope one day may be addressed is that it, it's slightly opaque 189 slightly opaque as to whether the applicant should assess the impact on the significance. They should assess the significance, but they should only assess the impact uh, in so far as they need to um, uh, in so far as they need to to sorry, I'll go back to the um, in so far as they need to work out um, the level of detail to give in the uh, in in the uh, assessment of significance because the level of detail given in the description of significance should be proportionate to the asset's importance and no more than is sufficient to understand the potential impact. However, what it does say, paragraph 190, says that the local planning authority should then understand the impact of the proposal on that significance. We think that's a slightly opaque way of putting it. We think that it would help applicants to, to, uh, to, to address the impact in the, in the uh, 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 statement, of, uh, statement of heritage significance. That's why we call these things statement of heritage, call the advice note statement of heritage significance, because actually the MPPF doesn't say in terms that the applicant should um, uh, uh, should should assess that. It says it in a roundabout way. We're not entirely sure that that's um, really uh, quite sufficient. Uh, sufficient. What we do say in the advice note is that it's in the owner's interest to do that, and it's useful. Um, it, once the, um, um, the the rest of the, the the rest of the stage approach goes on to start thinking about the way that the way that you go on from there. Once you've understood the impact of the proposal on that significance, you can then start to think about how you avoid, minimise and mitigate negative impacts. If there are ne negative impacts, uh, applications for listed body consent, for instance, should always try to be as far as possible without harm. Then uh, something else, which is to look for opportunity to better reveal or enhance significance, that's something that's possible. And then there are conditions about recording and so forth. Um, going on from there, As to the, the general approach to fulfilling the MPPF requirement, what is sometimes not, a, not appreciated is that, or it's not, it, it's there in the MPPF requirement in para 189, if you read it hard, and it took me some time to re actually realize this, that the significance needs to be fully understood in terms of the scope of the proposal. The description, that is the statement, needs to be proportionate to the asset's importance and sufficient for an appreciation of the impact of the proposal on that significance. Uh, as I keep saying whenever I um, stand up to talk about this, is go back to the MPPF every time. Another way of putting this is to say that the analysis of, uh, uh, of, of significance that is a process. It needs to be carried out sufficiently to understand the significance and the scope that is, you need to do as, not, as much uh, as you need to do uh, to understand the significance. But the description, the product of that analysis, uh, needs only to be done to a level of detail at which the impact on significance can be appreciated. If you've got something where, where you know, where, where you know, there's lots known about the, the, the significance, uh, you know, ordinary ordinary grade two listed terrace houses they're a kind of thing which we know a lot about and uh you know they're the kind of the, the kind of um uh, uh level of um um research which needs to be gone into to work out what it is that you're looking at is uh possibly rather less than it might be in other cases however 
uh, the 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 impact is something that you may need to may need to do quite a lot of. Uh, you 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 uh, if the if the if the impact is greater, then the impact then then the discussion of the 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 analysis of the significance may have to be spelled out a bit more. If the impact is really very small, then you would um, uh, um, you know, that would suggest a rather uh, um, uh, a, a rather you know a, a lesser um, amount of analysis um, put it another way the statement is proportionate not the analysis because it's the analysis which is important and the format doesn't really matter I'll come back to that in a minute um, I, all this is perhaps obvious uh, but um, I've seen too many statements which don't really start from the understanding of the scope and either miss out analysis of significance or go straight into a panoramic view of it. Uh, analysis must provide a full understanding of the history and the significance of the heritage asset, not just of one particular feature. Um, and it, you know, if you've got something where your uh, works to a single fire surround in a Grade Two listed building, uh, would not need to point, point out the significant would need to point out the significance of the fire surround in its location as part of the wider building. It um, but just as it would be wrong to look at it completely in isolation, just as the fire surround without mentioning the building, it would also be be, be unnecessary to start talking about you know, uh, 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 a fire surround in a country house and start talking about the stable block and the interesting, um, uh, you know, the woodyard, the stables, the importance of the estate in the 18th century history of fox hunting, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's just, the, just um, uh, a matter of being proportionate. Um, without taking the staged approach in the correct sequence, it's not easy and probably not possible to demonstrate that the significance has been taken into account in developing the proposal. Assessing significance before a proposal is planned can lead to better outcomes for the applicant by influencing the design by mitigating harmful impacts on significance, enhancing significance where possible, and thereby showing how any remaining harm is justified. And it's therefore not an, in, not an opportunity for advocacy. It's an objective analysis of significance, not an occasion to justify a scheme that's already been designed. We've all seen these and they rarely work. More than that, taking this process seriously is in the owner's interests. Such statements help the owner to take ownership of the scheme. Why not? and therefore to take responsibility for the proposals rather than leaving it to others. With that responsibility is likely to come understanding of the impacts and understanding of impacts helps provide a pathway to an acceptable scheme. And an acceptable scheme which satisfies the owner's wholly reasonable needs and desires, it's their asset after all, while at the same time satisfying the policy and therefore the local planning authority, historic England, the municipal society and so forth is win-win. Uh, I won't go on to talk much more about the, but, but to say much about this, except to, except to say that we generally feel that narrative statements are more useful than uh, uh, um, 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 those kinds of um, tabular analyses and things of that kind. Um, we feel that they work best if they're tackled as a narrative sta uh, statement at each assessment stage uh, uh, without trying to be too complicated, though there will always be complex cases where analysis may involve detailed assessment techniques and more complex forms of analysis such as sensitivity matrices and scoring systems. These may help to some extent, but as significance and impact are matters of qualitative and expert judgment, they are unlikely to provide a useful answer. We recommend that these kinds of analyses should be regarded as supporting material for a clearly expressed and non-technical narrative argument that sets out what matters and why in terms of the heritage significance of the assets effect, uh, affected together with the impact uh, of the proposal upon them. And we underline the fact that really simple cases may only need a really simple statement. Uh, I then gloss over um, at a bit of a discussion. These are matters which are covered in the advice note, consultant with the consultation with the um, local planning authority. Um, the archaeological evaluation, uh, there 
I've, I've really I've already quoted this section about archaeological potential, archaeological interest. Um, it is somewhat difficult because there is a well-developed process for dealing with archaeological interest. In no sense does the current advice, our current advice, preclude the need for archaeological evaluation. Indeed, the statement of heritage significance may largely form, uh, take the form of a, a desk-based assessment and field evaluation where necessary, simply discussing significance in the relevant place. Uh, in, in order to ensure the scope of the assessment or investigation meets the requirements of the local planning authority and avoids damage to heritage assets, it's good practice to discuss the scope of the work with the local planning authority and to agree a written scheme of investigation and uh, in, it, um, if necessary before commencement and you'll find more about that in good pla our good planning uh, good um, uh, our, our good practice advice uh, note two on managing significant significance in decision taking the historic environment which has got a whole section on that uh, what we generally advise is that uh, is that where archaeological evaluation needs to be done, then follow the uh, um, Chartered Institute for Archaeology standards. They cover all the, the necessary matters. Um, expertise. Uh, uh, that document there is is that a, a screenshot of uh, GPA two, and there's um, more information about. Uh, uh, appropriate expertise in there, uh, including all the uh, all the professional bodies like yours, which um, which can give um, uh, advice on these matters. Um, understanding, I'm not going to go uh, do, um, um, say very much about this. There is uh, a little bit of stuff in the in the note. I'm going to leave that much more to uh, to Duncan in the next section because I'm trying to go through. I do put just want to say something about design and access statements. Uh, we've not said, and we don't think, the design and access statements should be superseded by heritage statements or statements of heritage significance, as they have been uh, for listed buildings and various other matters in Wales, because we think that actually design is a really rather important point, uh, is a really important thing in terms of uh, dealing with uh, heritage uh, um, um, applications in the historic environment, you can often reduce the impact uh, on uh, heritage interest, uh, whatever you call it, significance, uh, by designing designing um, um, designing a proposal in a different way. And we think it rather just underlines that fact. There are, I, I've given the points there, the um, there are requirements uh, for design and access statements in certain heritage circumstances, like you know whether it's a conservation area or a, uh, a listed building. So that's covered. Uh, but we 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 don't think they should. We we're not convinced that they should be um, um, superseded. Um, so we we mention them. Other uses. This is a rather interesting point. Just to mention it, they can be used. Uh, obviously, as part of heritage impact assessments. Um, in the development plan, site allocation, we found it extremely useful to use them in terms of site allocation. And if you were listening to the longer one, I give you a rather interesting uh, uh, um, 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 example of one being used in Rotherham uh, and uh, various various other matters. Just to round this off, just to round this little bit off, um, uh, the MPAPF requirement is that understanding must stem from the interest of the heritage asset. Uh, and those interests are as written down there, and that this understanding um, follows a pro following appropriate analysis. They must describe significance, no matter what the level of significance or the scope of the proposal. They should be sufficient, though no more, for an understanding of the impact of the proposal on the significance, both positive and negative, and sufficient for the local planning authority to come to a judgment about the level of impact on that significance and therefore on the merits of the proposal. Uh, just very quickly, the HEAN does give, HEAN 12 does give some information about what the structure of a statement of heritage significance is. Broadly speaking, if it's a low significant, if the, if the significance is low and the impact is low, the document will be, be, be shorter than it would be if the, if the, if the, um, uh, if the interest is high and the impact is high. I have read the 
it's 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 a slightly different thing uh, because World Heritage Site, but the uh, the the heritage statement, uh, or whatever it's called, for the building of the uh, the, the road tunnel at Stonehenge, uh, that's 700 pages without uh, without the annexes. Uh, it's a really important thing, Stonehenge, and building a tunnel under it or near it is quite a big has quite a big impact. So you'd expect it to be quite a big thing. Um, we only we don't do very much more with um, oh dear, with uh, this is just to one of the ways of dealing with this is just to give an idea of what a, a heritage statement uh, sorry statement of heritage significance for a modest proposal to a heritage asset of lower significance might look like, and those are the things that might be covered. Uh, one that's a bit longer, oh dear, sorry. One that's a bit longer, a uh, more harmful proposal, you're starting to get more things coming in, more information that's going to be required. When you start, when you go up to a complex and harmful propo uh, uh, proposal, to heritage assets or assets of high significance, it's getting bigger still. Um, the that really is um, uh, all I want to say. I'll just leave that on the screen. Um, that's all I all I really want to see uh, say. Read this. This is the thing which which um, uh, uh, this is the advice note which we've written. And uh, Duncan's now going to take you through some examples in practice, which I hope will show that up. So thank you ever so much, Richard, for your presentation. And um, just before we move on to Duncan, we've got a couple of questions, which I'm just going to ask you if that's OK. Um, so first off, someone's asked, um, would you be able to provide a basic explanation of the difference between significant setting and impact? I think uh, significant so a, 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 a basic definition now of the difference between significant setting and impact. Significance is defined in the glossary of the MPPF. Uh, setting is defined in the uh, the glossary of the NPPF. Impact isn't. Impact is is the is the um, uh, is what is 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 uh, the effect on something. Uh, on a, a heritage asset for from uh, by the proposal impact is maybe um, um, beneficial or it may be harmful uh, uh, harm of course is something which has to be um, 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 borne down on or it, it, um, uh, hopefully removed if possible and it's the question of benefit. It, harm and benefit then begin to run together. And I mean, that's a big thing. And there are other bits of the MPPF, and we're currently drafting guidance about harm and benefit, because benefit, uh, you, once harm comes in, then uh, benefit kicks in as a reason to do the harm. But uh, that's, a, that's a big, big subject. And uh, Come to the um, the webinars, which we'll be running on that um, at some point in the future. <laughs> and then, I'll, I'll, I'm just going to say oh. I'll, I'll probably be saying a little bit about um, the difference between significance and setting in, in a moment as well. So perfect, thanks. And then just quickly before we move on, um, someone else has asked: Are those assessment stages of the analysis? Um, is that the analysis, description, and judgment mentioned earlier? Or is it the procedural stages defined in the legislation? Uh, no, it's just a it's just a handy way of, of going through the questions which need to be asked. Um, they're not really in the legislation as such. Um, uh, um, the legislation on some heritage assets or designated heritage assets is relatively is relatively sketchy. Yeah. Uh, but the policy. Um, sets out the way the questions should be asked um, and we think that that way of running running those questions in that staged approach just allows a measured approach to how the um how the, how, the, uh, how an applicant or a local planning authority can come to a come to a view on a case 
they're not really process, um, they're, they're about judgment. Perfect. Excellent. That... Um, thank you very much. And so um, we're going to run our final poll now. Um, and if Charlotte can pop that up on the screen, that'd be great. Um, oh. Hopefully, there we go. So who here has submitted or determined a listed building consent application or a, an application in a conservation area? And either it's never, you've determined some and submitted some for development, you've deter, determined some just for uh, listed building consent, or you've um, done for both types of applications. And sorry, that second bullet point should be for conservation areas. So. I have determined submitted applications for development in conservation areas, or I have determined submitted listed building applications. You have 15 seconds. Excellent. So again, we have a very uh, well uh, informed audience. We have 63% of you who have uh, either both determined and submitted both types of applications, conservation area and the some building consent applications. Excellent. So we're going to go back to Duncan now um, to finalise this presentation. Um, he will provide us with some practical advice on dealing with planning applications. And uh, back over to you, Dun um, Duncan. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to pick up. I mean, it's not. I'm not going to go through everything. Um, as you can probably appreciate, we we'd probably be here an awful long time uh, if we were to go through all the different issues that may or may not come up in the process of a typical um, uh, application or assessment uh, where heritage issues are. Uh, to the fore. Uh, what I wanted to do was just pick up on one or two things uh, and some of them flow very naturally from what Richard's been saying and you know if, I, I, if I'm honest you know uh, we, we are very much on board with the direction of travel that Richard's described there especially with regard to the role of experts and the, the uh, issues over proportionality and I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, I think that the first thing to bear in mind and I just wanted to make this clear you know um, we talk about the MPPF sometimes as if it's some kind of new thing. The, the principles in the MPPF have been around for a long time. Uh, planning Policy Statement 5 followed on from the old PBGs 15 and 16. Um, so, you know, we're talking 1990, we're talking 30 years now since those PPGs were first introduced. Planning Policy Statement really just reflected the same principles, the same type of approach. And the uh, MPPF um, really just followed that on. It, it didn't change anything fundamentally uh, in terms of they, the principles of understanding the resource, uh, understanding the nature of what you're doing, uh, and trying to use that understanding to inform the way a development proposal is taken forward. Um, you'll just have to forgive me, I'm in the middle of a thunderstorm, so if things do cut out or if you see lightning strikes or something, um, just please bear with me. Um, the joys of an English summer. Um, so, and of course, that's just the latest iteration. The, even the national planning framework is not standing still. So, um, this is, whoop, let's um, just bear with me a second. I shall get very hot now I've closed the window, but at least um, I might cut out some of the uh, background noise. Um, so, you know, the, these, this doesn't stand still and, and there's new guidance, new uh, policy uh, appears all the time. And as I was explaining earlier on, the uh, clarification on non-designated heritage assets was um, published in July 2019. Uh, and with a new planning white paper on the cards, uh, you know, who knows what to expect next. Um, um, and just bearing in mind uh, that also, I mean, I think we've talked um, generally about planning, but it, it's worth bearing in mind that nationally important uh, planning has a similar uh, set of provisions. In fact, a lot of it's using the identical language to that in the MPPF. So even if we're talking about uh, NSIP or DCO applications, um, we're talking the same language, we're talking the same approaches, we're talking the same principles. 
Um, the, you've already seen uh, this cover, um, a useful piece of guidance that's been produced by Historic England on uh, uh, making decisions in the historic environment. Uh, and as Richard said, that's worth that's one that's worth digging out and having a look at. Uh, just turning back, and again, you've seen this before. Richard's Richard's already put this on the the uh, and just talked about that description of significance, etc., and using appropriate expertise. I just wanted to reflect on that a little bit. Um, Certainly in terms of understanding significance, um, you know, there is a lot of information out there. Uh, you've seen some of it today, but there's an awful lot more. And this list I've put up here is only a snapshot of what's available, but it's a few additional things. So, you know, people like the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists have their standards and guidance, um, three of which uh, I've listed there, but there are a number of others. Uh, Historic England's Good Practice Advice Notes, uh, and the historic environment uh, advice, England advice notes also, you know, add further layers of information, further layers of understanding, which we can use when we're compiling um, our statements of significance, which then go on to inform our assessments uh, and, and so on. Um, when we're working, uh, and this is kind of our bread and butter, this is the kind of work we do uh, day in and day out, when we're looking at um, a particular proposal or a particular site. Um, these are the kinds of places we go to for information. So we will use um, uh, sources like the Historic England uh, National Heritage List. Uh, the local historic environment record is extremely important and it's worth pointing out that um, there was an important court case from 2019 which um, made it clear that a, a minimum requirement for any heritage uh, assessment is uh, a reference to the historic environment record. In fact, in that case, a uh, case from Yorkshire, um, the particular development was on the upper floors of a historic building. And even there, they still said, you didn't consult the historic environment record, therefore, you know, you're, you're, you, you fail to meet the minimum standard. So in, in engaging and, and, and looking at the historic environment record is now a fundamental part of the process. We'd also look at local record offices information, uh, historic maps, etc., uh, online sources, geological um, sources. In fact, during COVID, we've discovered that actually we can do vast amounts online, um, vast amounts more than we probably even imagined we could. Um, things like environment agency LIDAR data can be extremely useful in understanding where you've got a greenfield site, uh, about whether there are any features on the site, upstanding uh, earthwork remains, etc. Talking to the client and getting information from the client about information they have about their sites, geotechnical information, etc., uh, and a site visit. And uh, for the vast majority of our work, a site visit is absolutely fundamental. You wouldn't produce a report unless you'd been to the site and seen it in the flesh. In terms of expertise, um, I'm sure all of you have seen uh, reports of various standards, uh, and I'm not going to sit here and say, you know, any particular standard is better than any other. But I, we also see an awful lot of statements which come from um, people um, who, to be frank, you know, it, it's questionable where their expertise is coming from. Um, there are two main professional bodies um, that cover um, the historic environment. The Chartered Institute for Archaeologists, you've already heard about, and the Institute of Historic Building Conservation. Um, as the names imply, one has its uh, roots in archaeological practice and archaeological work. The other has its roots in uh, build, built conservation. Um, the reality is that they're closer and closer all the time in terms of their scope and, and work they do and the kinds of advice, etc., they're giving. Um, we would always recommend that you know, if you are sourcing um, someone to prepare a, a heritage statement or a, a statement of significance, that you, the first thing you should do is look for somebody who is a member of one of these institutes. Um, and if you're looking at the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists, uh, they also run a scheme, a registered uh, bodies scheme uh, for organizations. So what you may do is look to see whether the body in question who, have, who are submitting that document um, are, are signed up to that uh, registration scheme. Uh, that should give you some confidence that the individuals involved um, have the relevant uh, competencies uh, to be able to report on these matters. That said, there are an awful lot of experts out there who are not, not members of neither of these organizations or might not be members of any particular organization. Um, 
the, in an unregulated market, that's always a danger that um, you know you may have individuals who can produce these statements, uh, some of whom have a huge amount of expertise, some of whom might have less expertise, um, and there's nothing in the system that dictates you know who should or shouldn't be producing these statements. I just wanted to reflect a little bit on on this issue of setting. I know it's come up as a question um, there, and I think it's something which kind of reflects a little bit on on the way our system has evolved over recent years. Um, the 1990 Act, as we've already seen, uh, quite clearly states that um, historic buildings and their settings are protected by um, that piece of legislation. So if a building is listed, its setting is also a consideration in planning. Uh, and that is also stated, doubled up in the national planning uh, policy framework. Um, for a long time, this was something which was kind of given short shrift a little bit, if I'm honest. For a long time, we very rarely saw this come up as an issue. Um, occasionally, you might get it uh, arising from a development which was very close to a listed building. But on the whole, it was something that was rather marginal. Um, that all changed really um, when a, a wind farm in uh, Northamptonshire uh, went to the High Court uh, and the High Court reminded the decision makers, in that case the um, inspector who from, uh, from PINs, that actually they should be giving great weight uh, to the preservation of the setting uh, of uh, listed buildings where that setting contributes to their significance. Um, as a result of this, um, the, there has been some significant changes in this particular area, uh, and there's been a much greater emphasis on ensuring that settings are uh, form part of, you know, statements of significance and also part of the decision-making process. So again, the MPPF provides a, a nice uh, definition, uh, and effectively, you know, anything which is uh, within the area that might contribute to significance of the asset um, can um, be said to be within the setting. Um, and again, as I say, the, the, this was in this, this was already in the uh, legis primary legislation right from the beginning. So why it got forgotten about for so many years is uh, anyone's guess. Uh, Historic England, uh, their uh, GPA three. Uh, sets out um, the principles behind this and also sets out an approach to assessing impact on um, setting. And the key principles sitting behind this, all heritage assets have a setting, probably makes sense. Uh, the extent and importance of are often expressed by visual considerations. Um, setting is not curtilage. Uh, and earlier on, we, we had the question about curtilage. Curtilage is much more immediate. It's about the uh, buildings which and, and their immediate relationship, both in ownership and historic terms. Uh, setting is much, usually much more extensive than curtilage. Um, setting can enhance significance, uh, even if it wasn't designed to do so. So it can be accidental, that, that contribution. Uh, it doesn't depend on rights of way. So, you know, the fact that you can't see the asset from a particular viewpoint um, using a public right of way is, is irrelevant to our understanding. Uh, settings can be almost anything and we're still testing the guidance. What's important to understand is that setting is not significance. Setting, the, when we're talking about setting, we are talking about the contribution that setting makes to the significance of the asset. Um, so you often hear people talking about there's a negative impact on setting. That's probably inappropriate language. What we should be saying is an inappropriate uh, impact on the significance of the asset as a result of change in its setting. Um, it's a subtle argument, but it, it, it can be, it, it's quite important in certain contexts. And just a, a couple of strange examples. Of course, in urban contexts, setting changes all the time uh, and setting impacts are something which is day in, day out. Now there can be some aspects, and in London, there's been a lot of work done on views, particularly views of St. Paul's Cathedral and other key assets in London. Um, but we all know that assets are subject to significant change in their settings on a, a daily basis. What I believe set the settings work is designed to do is to event these kind of more immediate impacts. You'll be pleased to know this is not an English example. Um, and this is uh, the kind of thing which um, we did have to, conf have to confront. Um, you know, 
turbines going up uh, cheek by jowl with parish churches is something which has happened and, and has been an issue for us in the past. So this is the kind of thing that where you know the setting guidance is designed to help us through that process, help us understand what those impacts might be. Um, I want you to move on a little bit to this issue of proportionality and also going on to uh, a little bit on archaeology before I finish. Just on proportionality, uh, I, I can't support enough the words that Richard used earlier on. Uh, I, I, I'm in complete agreement with him that we do need to be proportionate. One of the problems we have in the sector is that we do have some um, heritage advisors um, uh, at local authorities and elsewhere who um, do things by rote um, and who often will ask us to do things even where it has no impact on our understanding of the asset or our understanding of the impact on the asset. Um, so, you know, it's very important that we don't fall into the trap of just saying, Oh, the guidance tells us to do it this way, so that's the way we do it. We have to apply our experience, our expertise, and our knowledge to understanding how we approach an individual case, and we should approach each case on its own merits. Now, that's not to say that we're going to get it right every time. That's certainly not the case. But what it means is that we shouldn't just be sitting down and going, right, I've done A, I've done B, I've done C, I've done D, there you go, it's done. That's an inappropriate way of approaching this. And I think that in terms of proportionality, that's a really important thing. Sit down, think about what the project is, what the asset is, what the proposal is, and think about how and what you need to under know to understand what those impacts might be and how they might affect that monument or that asset. And just going on finally to um, archaeological um, stuff um, and archaeological issues, again, uh, Rich has touched upon this, but I just wanted to make this clear. Um, and, and I think it's something that you know we do need to probably address uh, more clearly in some of the guidance we issue. Uh, archaeological interest uh, is about past human activity, were, and in MPPF terms, worthy of, expect, of investigation. Uh, looking at the Cambridge English dictionary definition, the study of buildings, graves, tools, etc. Um, and as, from my perspective, uh, and it's always been, I've always been the case, that archaeology is a process. It's about how we study the past. It's not um, uh, a thing in its own right. Um, and so archaeology is really a, is, is a, a technique that we can apply across the board, whether it be to individual monuments, individual landscapes, or whether it be applied to buildings. Uh, we apply this in various ways. When we're doing archaeological assessment, we can look at various records, such as the ones I had set out earlier. And for example, here, you've got a nice ring ditch, which has been discovered through aerial photography uh, and subsequent geophysical survey uh, demonstrated the evidence for this. This was a solar farm application, and we were able to um, isolate that monument so that uh, effectively it was excluded from the development. Um, and where we do identify potential features, uh, of course, we can ground truth them through archaeological field evaluation. And when the MPPF talks about field evaluation, this is effectively what it means. It means going out and digging holes in the ground, uh, usually on a sample basis, to try and uh, identify the location, character, and significance of the, the features that have been identified through the desk-based sources. It's worth bearing in mind that, of course, that um, the MPPF also allows for recording as a, a condition of approval or as a, as a, as a consequence of approval. Um, and again, I make the point here very strongly, that's not just about below ground archaeology, dirt archaeology, in the sense that uh, you might read it in the papers or, or understand it traditionally. Uh, archaeology is as much about understanding buildings in the built environment, townscapes, landscapes, etc., as it is about digging holes in the ground. And the layers of of uh, time depth within a building, uh, have you can apply the same stratigraphical approaches as you do to um, field work in, in the traditional sense of the term. Uh, and that's really important because, of course, what this is all about at the end of the day is actually improving our understanding of the past, improving our understanding of what's important, why it's important, how it got where it is, what's changed over time, so that we can tell stories 
to the people who, at the end of the day, we report to, which is the general public. And uh, that's me. Uh, if anybody wants to contact me at any point and ask any questions, please feel free to drop me a line. Uh, and um, I don't know whether we have any more questions or whether we're going to finish there. Thanks very much, Duncan. Um, we do have a few more questions, but um, thank you to both Richard and Duncan uh, for those insightful presentations. Uh, Faye will now take a look at some of the questions posed by our delegates. But just, in, just before that, we just wanted to say that if you do have any final questions, do keep asking them via the questions tab. Um, we will, as we said earlier, send out any answers not responded to today after the session. And you should, um, in a few minutes, find the entire presentation in the handouts tab as well. But uh, I'll now hand it over to Faye. Thanks, Faye. Um, so first off, we've been asked, what can we expect from the upcoming revision of the Listed Building Act? And will the, a greater degree of protection for non-designated heritage assets be introduced? So I don't know, maybe if Rich, if you want to have a go at that, answering <laughs> that one or? Uh, I'm, I'm, it's difficult, difficult to say, difficult to say. Uh, the white paper um, does mention the idea of owners using um, uh, uh, um, 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 uh, I can't remember whether they're not accredited experts, um, um, experienced expert, uh, experienced people to help to make applications. Um, quite what that means is difficult to say. It's a it's it's a, a, um, a phrase in a in a longer section. Uh, quite how any of that would work, um, where we we have you know there's been quite a lot of work on such matters, uh, but it's difficult to know exactly what. Um, at the moment, we do, we don't quite know what's proposed, and I think that's probably the easiest way to put it. I wish I wish I could help, but I'm afraid I can't. I I I I, I was unaware that the listed building um, uh, legislation was on the, was what on the cards for review. To be honest. Um. Oh, right. Thanks for another question. Um, perhaps maybe Duncan, you can maybe answer this one first. Then, <laughs> um, how can you objectively assess the development in a conservation area? if there isn't a conservation area management plan? Well, it's quite simple, really. What what, what we do um, and um, what we always recommend to our clients uh, when we're presented with a situation where we're asked to advise and, and, and help on a, a scheme within a conservation area where there's no appraisal or management plan is we say, well, we'll have to go away and write it. The, our, our first job is to sit down and go, what is it about this conservation area which is important? Um, and and why is it important and then come back to the specifics of the site and and, and try and address the specifics of, of what's going on the site in the context of the conservation area so so we have in the past uh, we did a scheme on a small conservation area where in effect we wrote a conservation area appraisal for the whole conservation area because it was so small in other cases we would write an appraisal which focused in on that part of the conservation area which might be affected but in effect we would go away and try to write our own appraisal um, as a starting point for our analysis of that scheme sorry just to um, continue on from that question if you were just speaking on behalf of some of the local planning authority uh, young planners that are on here today if they were the ones making the decision on an application for a conservation area without a conservation area appraisal obviously they can't go away and write one themselves and um, that's up to their policy teams but how would you perhaps advise them or guide them on um, assessing a proposal in those instances well if, if if there was an if there was a, a heritage statement produced to support the application um, then I'd hope that it would be robust enough to allow them to understand what the impacts were based on that assessment um, if there isn't, if it hasn't been, uh, and they're being asked to judge, make that judgment, um, then to be honest, they're, they're they're pretty much in the dark because they're going to have to go away and and do that assessment themselves. Um, uh, one would hope that they might have conservation officer colleagues who would be able to assist them with that process. Um, but yeah, I mean, eff effectively, what 
I would always ask is that um, that they, in the first instance, um, they should be asking the applicant to go away and do that analysis for them if there is no conservation area appraisal available. Even if there's a conservation area appraisal available, um, we would still use that as the kicking off point for any site specific analysis. Um, and I think one of the things I would say to any planner, young or old, it uh, doesn't make any difference to me, um, is that what I would ask them to do is, is to actually think about those kind of boring sections at the start of uh, heritage assessments, which actually set out what's been done, how it's been done, the approaches that have been followed, the methodology that's been followed, because those are the bits that should give them confidence that actually there are, the, the work's been done in an appropriate way. Um, we do see examples where you get reports, um, both in terms of individual listed buildings or conservation areas or whatever, where it just goes straight into the meat of it and you've got no understanding of where they're coming from, what they've done, how they've done it, what guidance they're using, you know, uh, and, and often those are the more difficult ones to, to quite work out where it's coming from and, and what they're doing. It, they're, you know, as I say, those, those bits at the start of these reports can be quite dull, but actually they do help you understand whether the thing's been approached in the right way or not. Um, so kind of talking about the topic of proportionality, if say like it was a fairly small application and like of little significance with no impact, would this be something which you could say like a planning consultant would write just a short succinct statement or is that something which we should be going to an expert? As, as somebody who earns their living doing this, I'd say never go to a planning consultant to write that. No, no. <laughs> I mean, again, I would every case on its merits. I, I, I think it's always I would always prefer it to um, to, to go in front of, you know, uh, somebody who who specializes in looking at these things. That, that would always be my preference, if I'm honest. Um, uh, but I would also say that, you know, you don't have to throw the kitchen sink at every application. Sometimes a shorter. Um, I mean, I looking at a proposal at the moment where a very detailed desk based assessment was done about 10 years ago and you know we're saying well we don't need to do another desk based assessment it would just be a waste of everyone's time you know it's much better to go away and say has anything happened in the intervening period if it hasn't then you've already got the information you need to be able to make that judgment and all we need to do is is to summarize those conclusions and 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 let it go forward or not on the basis of that that work that was done previously perfect so um just thinking of just another scenario, um, if you were looking maybe to remove a listing, would you use a statement of historic significance in that instance? And if so, how would you address it to be able to remove the listing? I'll, um, shall, I, shall I start on that one? Uh, Richard, j jump in if you if you want to. I mean, we have done, we've, we have worked with clients where um, they have wanted to either remove listing or actually remove buildings which are on the list. Uh, and we approach them in exactly the same way. We, we start by you know, that neutral position of saying, okay, what is it? What is, what is the building? What is the asset that you're looking at? Why is it significant? Um, uh, and what is significant about it? Um, and in those cases, what you often go back to is, you know, are there factual errors on the listing description, were there, were there, and again, a lot of early list descriptions are very, very brief. Um, uh, so it's going back and saying, you know, were there, mis were there not mistakes, but were there misunderstandings? Were there aspects which um, weren't described in detail in the original list description? Uh, on one of them, um, it was kind of included in the list almost by accident. The actual, we, we believe the feature they were trying to list was next door but there was one statement which included the feature that we were looking at uh it wasn't clear whether it was actually meant to be included in the list at all um but again you go back to first basics you st you sit down and you try to work out whether it's significant and if it is significant what includes and in, what uh, what what um contributes to significance and in terms of the process um historic england have a, a process um and you can submit submit information and request um, that a building is delisted or you can go through the planning process because of course local authorities can give permission for the loss of a listed building if if they feel that either its significance is 
um, uh, incorrectly stated, or if they feel that the public benefits outweigh the harm? Yes. Um, the uh, the I mean, there's nothing much I can really add to that. And there is a anybody can apply for a building to be listed. Anybody can can apply for a building to be delisted. Uh, if you go onto the historic website, you'll find um, all the all the forms that you need to do that. It is kind of uh, it's not a particularly common thing for a building to be delisted. Uh, uh, the, the majority of cases where it does happen are of, uh, as, as Duncan outlines, where uh, um, a building has, oh dear, um, 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 we've listed, you know, the building's been listed and it's the wrong building. It's the building next door. Because, of course, it's the address which is the listing. The address bit of a list, the list description, is, is the listing. And if you just happen to get, you know, 125B instead of 125A, uh, which is which is which is possible occasionally. Uh, it, it can go wrong. There is a requirement in the Act for local authorities to go through the list to check that the addresses are right when a listing is 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 carried out. So hopefully it it is it it it, um, it doesn't it doesn't happen. Uh, that sort of that sort of mistake doesn't happen. Really. There are occasion occasions when something was genuinely mistaken for something which it actually wasn't. There's a, a case in Kent of a, many years ago, there was a case in Kent of a building which was listed as being 16th or 17th century. And uh, somebody then pointed out years later that actually it dated from 1927. Uh, the building itself, um, it wasn't delisted because although it was listed originally as a very interesting example of a 16th or 17th century timber frame house, it, it actually was listed a very. Uh, it was relisted as a very interesting example of a 1927 timber frame house. That sort of thing. Uh, that sort of thing can happen. We don't. Um, I, I hasten to add these things. There is a uh, uh, obviously a very careful um, approach taken to getting these things right, but you know, occasionally things happen. Things slip. Mm. Excellent. I think that's the um, end of our questions for today. There have been many more asked and we will um, send them around um, to our two panellists uh, before sending the um, answers back to all of you. So thank you again to everyone who joined us from near and far. We will um, next week send a copy of the video recording and the presentation slides if you haven't already downloaded it and any answers uh, from unanswered questions um, and they will all be emailed to all participants. If you'd like to keep an eye out on the RTPI website we, for some more virtual opportunities, including one tomorrow on the white paper. So if you want to really uh, go back to back with your CPD options, um, uh, a really good one held by, I think, King's Chambers on the white paper tomorrow. And then early September, um, there's one being held and led by Mr. Graham Gover, a solicitor based in Exeter, on the recent changes to uh, permanent development rights, which is also very important to get to know more about. So. Um, that kind of concludes our evening. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you, Richard. And um, of course, Faye. <laughs> and thank you to all of you um, for joining us today. A feedback survey will launch immediately after the session. Please do take time to answer the questions and let us know how we did. We hope it's all good. But uh, we look forward to seeing you all again very soon. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye.